my good is presentation. Okay, yep, I see it. Can you see my talk here? Yes. You see it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And then. Um, okay. Well, I guess ready when you are. Okay. Can you? How, okay. how much yeah. time do we have, Frank? Um, hour and a half, or if you want to go longer, probably a little bit more too. I'll try to stick to that. Uh, my, uh, I've been fighting some allergies, and I tend to lose my voice the the, the longer I talk. So uh, it's probably going to get rough as I go on. I'm just giving you heads up that I'll have to clear my throat uh, okay. more often than I'd like to. Me. Okay, okay, here we yeah. are. I'm I'm going to um, yeah. just kind of open my camera for a few minutes, and then I'm going to shut it down. I, I'm afraid my computer may. Uh, is it uh, may go crazy on me? Is the computer plugged into power? The laptop? No, I'm I'm, I'm on my desktop. It came okay. back. It was some, for some reason, you know, uh, it just decided that it wanted to update something, and it logged my PowerPoint, so it wouldn't open. But it's uh, it's 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 up and going now. So okay, cool. Yeah, and our um, for our club business, do I'll do that real fast. Uh, we have the upcoming thing on the twenty seventh of May. I typed wrong on the email that I sent out first. Um, so it's in a couple weeks from now at the Great Park in Irvine, doing the grafting demonstration. Uh, some sign wood of um, tropical plants. Uh, Romero, on, on, on a quick thing on dragon fruit. In two weeks, would it be a good time to graft dragon fruit? Well, what would be the reason for grafting? Um, just for someone who want to mess around with it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's springtime, although with the weather we're, we're having, you know, it's it's kind of a tough call. But if the plants are protected, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, just side question. Yeah, I mean, it's only going to, hopefully, it's only going to warm up, but, you know, <laughs> June coming, or, coming around and then June bloom, and but who knows how the weather is going to turn out, you know, over the next couple of weeks. But, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's a good time. Okay. Plants, are, plants are pushing growth, though, so, you know, it's, it's a good time. Yeah, well, it has a, my weather thing says it's a 21% chance of rain tonight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and if you do graft, cover the graft, then that should be fine, but. Okay, so, okay, so um, you want to start with your presentation. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think we have a good crowd today. Uh, coffee, it's been uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, it seems like uh, we get from excited, you know, pl get to play with exciting things. First dragon fruit, now coffee, and uh, and I get, I like to enjoy both of them. So, no complaints on my end. You know, keep me busy, keep me employed, and uh, and then I and, and I enjoy them, the fruit and the drink. So, um, hello everyone. My my name is Ramiro Lobo. I'm a farm advisor with the uh, University of California Cooperative Extension. And uh, for the last, I would say, 10 years, we've been playing with coffee. And uh, a lot of what we've done with coffee, at least, you know, taking care of the plants and uh, at, at the field research station, it's uh, mainly due to, you know, thankful to Tony Pacheco, who has been a, a volunteer. And, and really, he's uh, got a magic touch for a coffee plant and propagation. So we've been working on this together for for longer. And uh, also collaborating with some folks at uh, Cal Poly Pomona, 
where uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the research we've done in collaboration with them. And uh, some local growers in San Diego, Scott Murray, uh, it's been uh, a good collaborator and we'll we are, have a few projects that are gonna be starting uh, over the next few uh, weeks with some uh, newer varieties that we've uh, gotten seeds for. And also Mike Milano at the flower fields and his foreman, Jess Williams, have been really great to work with. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about coffee, coffee, uh, coffea arabica, and uh, as a new crop for Southern California. And uh, and this, uh, whether it is a new crop, whether it can be a, a new house plant. I mean, some of you may already have a coffee plant in your homes. It makes a wonderful house plant as well. And uh, if not for commercial growing, at least consider it as a backyard plant or as an indoor plant. It does well uh, you know, in both environments. So for an overview, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about facts and figures quickly though, as a, you know, just kind of a interesting fact about the global and the US coffee industry. Then we talk about taxonomy and cultivated varieties. Try to talk uh, about Cafe Arabica, the genus and uh, Typica versus Bourbon and, uh, and, and, and Canephora or Robusta coffee as well. And then we're going to talk kind of an overview of coffee growing requirements, climate, soil, water, propagation, flowering, harvesting, and processing of the cherries. Then I'll tell you a little bit about coffee production in the U.S. and Southern California, share some of our experiences uh, and uh, our research efforts, and then we'll close and uh, have a few questions. I got a list of questions, and hopefully this will be answered uh, throughout the presentation. If not, we'll uh, get to uh, fill them at the end or as the uh, topic, if any of the photos or comments trigger the question, feel free to ask it if, uh, if I uh, happen to, you know, not to mention the, uh, specifically what you're interested in. So coffee is second only to oil as the world most traded commodity with a value of more than uh, 100 billions annually. 500 billion cups of coffee are drank daily. Uh, this uh, means there is a lot of people who drink more than one cup. I mean, and we'll see that uh, as we talk about coffee consuming countries. Coffee farms support 25 million people worldwide. It's grown in 50 countries in Asia, Africa, South America, and Central America and the Caribbean. 90% of the coffee growing or production happens in developing countries. Uh, oh, this is, uh, I forgot to update this comment here, but uh, the Netherlands have surpassed Finland as the most uh, drinkers per capita in the world. And the U.S. ranks about 25th. Um, the retail value of the, US, of the U.S. coffee market is nearly uh, $50 billion. And uh, about 55% of that is a specialty coffee or considered specialty. Uh, I would say that about 48% of U.S. coffee cups are perceived by consumers as being specialty coffee, meaning that uh, they buy coffee at coffee shops and not necessarily at uh, some of the, uh, you know, convenience store like uh, gas stations or, or places like that. Uh, daily consumption um, seems uh, steady at 35% but it's uh, somewhat declining in favor of other beverages between 20, in the ages 25 to 39. Uh, the, US, uh, the US is the single largest buyer of coffee. We buy about 20, uh, 28 million bags, and these are 60 kilogram bags uh, in 2014, and the number remains about the same. Uh, over half of Americans over 18 drink coffee daily, and uh, and we average about three and a half cups a day. Oh, sorry, cups a day, and uh, does uh, it provides 75 percent of our caffeine? So, no decaf. The producing regions, uh, coffee is grown in the tropical belt, as you can see, uh, and 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 that um, range uh, is expanding. Uh, mainly because of global warming, uh, as you can see within the continental, U I mean, within the U.S., we got South, South Florida, where the uh, climate is uh, somewhat conducive to coffee, and uh, in Hawaii, which is uh, primarily where coffee is grown in the U.S., and uh, just about the southern tip of California is included in that range, and uh, and that's why we're seeing uh, coffee. 
uh, grown here uh, in the U.S. Although you know it is uh, we face uh, significant challenges. Is this here for growing coffee? Top producing countries: Brazil is by far the king of coffee growing, uh, uh, followed by Vietnam, then Colombia, and uh, and Indonesia. Uh, then Ethiopia is a uh, fifth, and uh, and uh, Honduras comes in, which, by the way, I'm from Honduras, uh, comes in at 6.1 million sacks, and uh, then Uganda. The, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, Brazil produces a significant amount of uh, robusta coffee, not only Arabica, so uh, that is sort of a mis uh, misleading figure there. Not all of it is uh, Arabica. Uh, the, Vietnam is primarily robusta, and so is Indonesia, and uh, all the other countries like uh, Colombia and uh, Ethiopia, Honduras, and, and and all the other countries listed grow primarily um, Arabica coffees, and these are high ground. Uh, th these are grown at higher elevation, for the most part. Uh, a lot of uh, coffee grown under shade. Uh, except for Colombia that they in Brazil that the Arabica coffee is grown in full sun, relatively flatter and uh, lower elevations in Brazil, but not so in, in Colombia where they grow at higher elevation, but, but in full sun. And uh, the other interesting thing is they say, talking to coffee experts, they say that the range of coffee or the altitude at which you can grow coffee because of climate change, it... Uh, it increases about 50 meters every 10 years. So the the uh, what used to be a lowland coffee was anything below a thousand meters above sea level, but now that uh, that threshold is is even is a little bit higher. So you can grow, um, and 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 on the upper end you can grow coffee now at 1800 meters in the, in in the Andean region where uh, a few years ago or several years ago, that wasn't heard of because of uh, propensity or, or the risk of uh, frost damage at that elevation. But more and more we're seeing coffee at higher elevations in Colombia and uh, Peru and Bolivia and, uh, and even uh, some parts of Venezuela as well in the uh, Eastern uh, edge of the Andean mountain range. As far as taxonomy, this is the genetic tree of coffee. And uh, it all started with, uh, with four primary, you know, is in the Rubiaceae family, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But there are four prim primary species that were uh, the Liverica, the Antoniae, the Eugenioids, and the Canephora. Then from there, uh, we had a, a natural hybrid, uh, hybrid that came up in Ethiopia. And um, and that gave uh, birth to the Arabica line of coffees. And then the Canephora has stayed pretty much the same. And that's what we know as uh, Robusta coffee, which is uh, it's a, it's a significantly different uh, species and uh, morphology, uh, tolerance to pests and diseases, and a whole bunch of different things. So the Arabica coffee from Ethiopia, an accession of that, was taken to Yemen, and, uh, and those were the uh, lines, the Tipica and the Bourbon line were separated. The Bourbon was taken by the French to Reunion Islands or to the island of Bourbon, now Reunion Island. And the uh, Tipica was uh, uh, sent to over to, uh, to Java and then on to Brazil. So we had those main lines and these two, Tipica and Bourbon, pretty much account for most of the uh, genetic makeup of the varieties that we grow today. That said though, these varieties are highly productive, high quality, high, you know, great qual uh, copying quality, that is meaning tasty and uh, really preferred by consumers. However, they are very susceptible to, to, to pests and diseases. And, um, and primarily they are susceptible to coffee leaf rust, which is a uh, Hemilea bostatrix. And that's, uh, Ross pretty much eliminated uh, coffee production in, in Latin America in the uh, late in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, which were primarily farming a variety called Katura. Katura was kind of a, it was a, a semi-dwarf variety, highly productive, 
very precocious and uh, adapted really well to most environments in Central and South America. So it was the industry was based on Katura, but uh, the, the Ross pretty much annihilated that. So in the 40s, uh, somebody discovered, if you look at the purple segment of the tree here, the hybrid from Timor, which is a, a line of a hybrid from the Robusta genus, from the Canephora genus, and that proved to be resistant to the rust. So since then, they've started um, breeding uh, genes from the Timor hybrid to the either the Bourbon or the typical lines to give them some resistance to rust. And so um, a lot of the uh, varieties that are grown today uh, commercially, as you can see listed in the purple uh, section of the three, are uh, have some uh, robust uh, genes in them. And so I've asked some of the breeders in Central America, well, at what point are you going to stop calling this an Arabica if, uh, you know, if you keep, uh, you know, in, in inserting uh, Canephora genes? And they say, well, you know, we do back crosses and we try to, we kind of uh, in, uh, make sure that we get the, the, the gene that, co that uh, causes the resistance or tolerance. And then we uh, cross it back to, to incorporate the Arabica genes. Uh, that said, though, the, 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 the rust and fungus mutates rapidly, and there is a, uh, every time uh, they come up with a variety that is highly tolerant to it, uh, it uh, it's, it's only a matter of a few years before the fungus breaks that resistance. So as the, there is a saying in, far, you know, in agriculture, you know, diamonds are forever, but resistance is not. And um, with the coffee leaf rust, it is, uh, it is true. There is like, I think, I don't know, 30, I think, races of uh, Emilea that are rampant, you know, impacting coffee growing in the, um, in the world. The orange line here is another set of varieties that, uh, that tend to pretty much represent the typical line. These are taller varieties, uh, lanky plants, uh, lower yielding, but really but produce high quality coffee. And, uh, and they are still growing in, in some parts of the world. I mean, uh, Hawaii grows uh, the Kona coffee, which is uh, nothing more than a Guatemala and Tipica that was taken to Hawaii years ago, and it adapted fairly well to Kona. And, uh, and it, uh, you know, kind of a, the, the terroir of the Kona volcanic soils and the climate gave it uh, some distinguishing uh, exceptional characteristics. And that's why it became famous as a Kona as a Kona coffee. The, uh, some of the uh, heirloom varieties, which are the Ethiopian uh, selections, that includes, I believe, the, um, there is a Geisha variety, and that in the green uh, branch, and, and that variety, Geisha, has become uh, really the, uh, I was gonna say the Cadillac of the coffee industry, but I don't know, is it a Tesla or what should I say? Or a, or a Rivian. What brand of car should I compare it to these days? Uh, it's 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 really become the uh, the la, la creme de la creme as far as coffee quality goes, um, and that's what uh, some of the local growers here in Southern California have tried to grow. Although the the odds are you know stacked against them, is a is a very uh, weak variety from a from a morphological standpoint, a weak uh, a weak root system. Uh, very slow to grow, low yielding, uh, but it produces by far the best uh, cupping quality coffee there is. And, uh, and it's broken the record for a price per pound, you know, where uh, Panama has become like the epicenter of the geisha coffee in the world. And uh, Panamanian geishas have sold at international auctions for upwards of $1,200 a pound. So there you go. It's, uh, it's a pretty expensive coffee, but it's, uh, it's all tied up to the specific location as well, because uh, the same, I mean, Geisha has won uh, cupping competitions in Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and um, the price, uh, you know, at, at international auctions for the Cup of Excellence winners hasn't been really as high. So again, the, the purple varieties are the ones that are mostly grown today. 
uh, a few growers grow some of the uh, red varieties, uh, the, the red branch varieties, still some Katura, some Bourbon, some Via Sarchi, and these tend to be a uh, higher uh, Bourbon descendants with high copying quality, but still very uh, highly susceptible to, um, to the leaf rust. And uh, the same holds true for some of the typical lines, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Kona, the Maragojipe, which is uh, another uh, line, a variety that, that is, produces very, very good coffee. Uh, Pacheco Moon is very popular in Guatemala. Blue Mountain is very popular in, uh, in Jamaica. Blue Hidalgo is kind of uh, from Mexico. So all of these varieties, even though they are different names uh, genetically, tend to be very close. Every branch tends to have some uh, really, uh, they share a lot of the genetic makeup, but they take on a regional identity depending on where they are grown. Any questions up to now? Okay. So family Rubiaceae is the, the same as coffee or matter family. There is about 450 genera, 6,500 species worldwide. Uh, plants have simple undivided leaves, opposite usually uh, of each other, perpendicular to each other. And, um, and there's usually a, a, a bud or a shoot in, uh, in every uh, pair of leaves. There is clusters of, uh, actually clusters of shoots or buds. And uh, one of the challenges that we face here in San Diego is that, and I'll mention that later on, but as in talking about the, the, the leaves and the buds, uh, the challenge is that our plants, because of environmental factors, they, are, they get confused. And oftentimes they don't know we don't, the trigger for the uh, buds to differentiate into flowers or shoots, the plants get confused and they send shoots when they should, you know, in, 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 in the apex where they should be putting flowers. And so they really get overcrowded and, uh, and the, the, the growth is abnormal. It's not what you see typically in, a, in, the, in, you know, in the tropical belt. So the uh, genus Coffea has about 100 to 120 species identified, but only three are commercially relevant. And that is the Arabica, Canephora, and a bit of the uh, Eugenioids. Liberica, it's um, some really big beans, but they are not necessarily commercially grown. It's sort of a curiosity. Um, Coffea arabica originated from the forests of Ethiopia and South Sudan. Canephora or robusta coffee originated from Western and Central Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it is, uh, Canephora is one of the two diploid parents of arabica, which is a completely different cultivar from, uh, from, the, from robusta, that is, which is a much higher caffeine content. content. The Eugenioids um, is native to the highlands of East Africa, including Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and is the other parent of Coffea arabica, and it has a, a much lower caffeine content. Liberica, it's, it's got, as I mentioned, little commercial value. So question, how many kinds of coffee are you familiar with? Uh, have you tried, uh, are you familiar with the, uh, can you distinguish the flavors of Arabica or Robusta? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. You, we should ask you to show your camera so that we'll see who's participating. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've tried several varieties and unfortunately I can't tell the difference. They taste really good though. All right. Can you distinguish between a robusta and an arabica? I know I couldn't. Yeah, most of the uh, espresso recipes in, have a high percentage of robusta in it because uh, the uh, the higher caffeine content it it is a darker drink, the um, uh, tartar 
bitter. I mean, they describe the robusta taste as a burnt rubber sometimes. I mean, I mean, I've never tried or tasted burnt rubber, but but it doesn't sound appealing. But it does. Uh, the higher caffeine content makes it, you know, uh, give it some bitterness. But some of the main differences between arabica and robusta is the taste. Arabica is by far the better flavor. And some of these uh, high-end Arabica, like I mentioned, the Geisha, it's a very light uh, colored drink, um, very acidic, high acidity. And it almost doesn't look like coffee, or at least, you know, what we've gotten used to here in the US, you know, which is a French roast uh, uh, from Starbucks. You know, which is it's just kind of a dark coffee, and usually that is uh, far from uh, being a, a good quality coffee. So the, the geisha is a very light color, almost look like an infusion, and very light uh, acidity, very complex flavor. Caffeine content, robusta has much more caffeine uh, with two point seven percent versus a one and a half percent for arabica, and that uh, that has a lot to do with the resistance, I think, to some of the diseases and pests, because they find it that it's not as tasty as an arabica bean, perhaps. Uh, lipid and sugar content, arabica has about sixty percent more lipids than uh, and almost twice as much sugar than robusta, and uh, the sugars are also. Uh, it's just interesting now that uh, Brazil and a few other robusta producing countries are playing with uh, processing methods trying to increase the sugar content in the robusta beans. And uh, so they are processing it more as either naturals or honeys. And, uh, and, and they are getting into what they call the uh, specialty robusta. Ecuador is doing a, is doing a lot of that as well. Uh, Brazil is doing a lot of that, and uh, and apparently the flavor is improved considerably. Um, the price is much higher for Arabica than it is for Robusta, although the productivity is is almost the reverse. You know, Robusta yields almost as I mean, as twice as much as the Arabica. So I guess that's the uh, compensating factor there. Uh, that said, though, in places like Honduras, Robust it is illegal to grow Robusta or Canephora coffee. Because the uh, the Honduran Coffee Institute and um, or the Honduran government uh, and, and Honduras and other countries uh, think that uh, if the if robusta is robusta is grown, it will sort of diminish the profile of uh, quality growing as, a, as their profile as a quality coffee growing country. Care and maintenance robusta is much easier to care for. Very hardy plants. Um, nematode tolerant uh, resistant or tolerance uh, to to leaf rust and uh, again very strong plant uh the plant height and bean shape uh the plant the robusta plants are much bigger the leaves are huge uh much bigger than the uh, arabica coffee these are taller you know taller from four and a half to six meters versus two and a half to four four and a half of the arabica and that is on the on the high on the tall arabica plants. I mean, some of the dwarf and semi dwarf plants barely make it to to you know to two meters per se. The uh, chlorogenic acid, uh, which is on the, what gives the coffee antioxidant activity, is more higher in the robusta with seven to ten percent than arabica at five and a half to eight percent. And um, all in all, though, cultivation, Arabica represents about 75% of the world uh, coffee production, and Robusta represents about 25%. And uh, with Brazil and Vietnam as primarily uh, the largest producers. Uh, some other things, how uh, the varieties. Typica coffees originated from plants that went from Yemen to Java and the neighboring islands, then on to Brazil. Bourbon coffee from plants taken to Bourbon by the French and then taken to, um, to France and the Netherlands and from then to uh, Guyana, to French Guyana in South America and then on to Brazil. And then they spread uh, like weeds pretty much in the tropical belt in, in Central America and then on to Hawaii as well. Uh, kind of a map of the distribution, as I as I mentioned. Let's see if I can get a pointer here. The laser red. 
Oh. Well, we'll forget that. But this is just the map showing how coffee were originated. The Robusta in uh, Western Africa and the um, and the uh, Arabica in Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, from then on to Yemen and then to France or from Yemen to Reunion Islands uh, near Madagascar. And then uh, they found their way to, to Brazil, to South America and then to Central America and and uh, where we are today, so. Was there a question? Yes, there was a qu um, two questions. One was, um, why is the coffee in the U.S. so bitter? Or it's saying it's they mean it's saying sour and bitter. And then um, somebody is not sure which plant they have. They have a coffee plant, but they don't know which type it is. Uh, um, verbica or robusta. Um, how can they tell? It is possible to tell by looking at it. Yeah, uh, it, between a, an arabica and robusta, it is it is fairly easy. A robusta plant, it's it's uh, it blows you away, you know, with how big the leaves are, and the leaves, in, in addition to being big, they have ribs. They are ribbed, easily distinguishable in that sense. Um, and then the uh, the clusters of beans on the robusta tend to be really well defined. It's like nuts every like two inches or so on the lateral branches but uh but other than that but yeah i mean uh, if uh, if if i saw a picture i could tell you if it is a robusta or or a th or you know or arabica why coffee in the us is bitter because it has a, one is um we tend to consume if you buy you know costco walmart or the regular you know store brands they they tend to be for one they tend to be low quality coffee uh you know a commodity coffee i mean it's a commodity right so it's it's traded in the u.s stock exchange um new york stock exchange so it is a commodity and what you buy is commodity coffee when you get into the uh commodity coffee it's anything that barely makes it to about 80 in the copying score based on the specialty coffee association so anything above 80 is considered a specialty, but then there are <clears throat> there are special, really special specialty coffees, right? The higher the score, the processing, and uh, and other aspects that uh, that give coffee the flavor. So realistically speaking, though, with coffee, you can mess up the quality at various points. One is. You start with the wrong genetics, right? The wrong variety that doesn't give you a good quality coffee. But assuming you have a good variety that gives you a decent quality coffee, then when you pick it, will affect the quality. If you pick a coffee that is still green or, or not fully ripe, not at full maturity, the flavor is going to be off. Then once you uh, pick that cherry, how do you process it? You know, whether you, you process it as a, as, a, as a wash method, you know, meaning that you pulp it, ferment it, and then wash the mucilage off, or you process it as a natural, and we'll talk more about this later on in the presentation, or you process it as a natural where you dry the cherries as they come off the plants, or an intermediate step, which is a honey processing, where you remove the rind, remove the skin, but do not ferment it or remove the mucilage so you dry it with the mucilage on and that will affect the flavor the flavor profile so i would say when you go to a coffee shop try ask for one of those a coffee with a you know process differently for like a honey processed coffee or a or a hard uh, or a high ground coffee um a super hard bean, which is another designation for good quality coffee because it, it, it talks about the density of the bean, which is typically associated with higher elevations. So you will uh, you will see you will have a different experience. And if you can ask for varietals, uh, that would be even better. You know, uh, then you can uh, obviously geisha tends to be quite pricey. But there are coffees like a Blue Mountain, which is from uh, here in the, uh, on the screen from uh, from Jamaica, 
There is the uh, Maragohipe, the Java is a good variety. Geisha, obviously, Kona coffee is a good one. Um, which other one I'm seeing here that I'm familiar with? Pacheco Moon, which is a Colombian variety, very tasty as well. Via Lobos. And then on the Bourbon lines, I mean, just about every variety here, it's uh, tend to have really good tasting, a good cupping quality. The uh, SL28, 24, the Tequizic, the Azarchi, Pacas, Pacamara is sort of the uh, second to Geisha in terms of winning a Cup of Excellence competition in Central America. It's won several times in El Salvador, and so has Pacas. And the uh, same applies uh, to Bourbon, any of the Bourbon lines. So all of these have uh, are, are not as uh, dark. And then the other thing with coffee, you end up with, uh, you do your best at uh, processing the coffee, end up with your green coffee, which is what you roast. But then you roast it too dark. And then you mess it up. I mean, no matter what you did at that point, if you if you went too dark on the roast, then uh, you ruin that coffee because you burn all the sugars and bring out all the oils in that bean and uh, and it will uh, pretty much make it uh, acidic, but, but in a bad sense and, uh, and, and, and some bitterness because it'll be burned. So it all these different things. And then you can also talk about the extraction method, how you extracted the coffee, how you, you brew it, you know? It, it makes a difference whether you use a percolator or a, or a French press or a, uh, or a V60 or a, any other, you know, pour over type methods, which seems to produce a higher quality, better tasting uh, coffee drinks. And then the typical uh, Bourbon crosses, some of the uh, Mundo Novo is a good variety, Akaya, Katuai, Maracatura. So all of these, uh, I mean, there is a whole bunch. It's, this is like what happens with dragon fruit, you know, what everybody who got a plant decided to give her a name, I guess. And, uh, and that's why we have so many varieties. Genetically though, they, they tend to be uh, quite uh, closely related. So the Timor hybrid, if you can see the picture here, this is uh, the, 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 uh, the representative of the Robusta line. Uh, you can see the leaves, how they are correct for it. They have like ribs. They have like, uh, I don't know if it's visible well enough here. And I cannot, max, you know, I was trying to maximize the picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, the plants tend to be more uh, vigorous, bigger, robust. And that's, I guess, why they call it robusta, because it is a, it's a bigger plant. It's, uh, it's coffee on steroids okay the timor hybrid is a naturally occurring cross between canephora and arabica that happens in the island of timor in southeast asia uh, these are known as arabusta hybrids and they were natural res resistance to leaf rust and uh and again you know they started to become popular in the 50s as a source of uh genes to, to, to insert tolerance to leaf rust in some of the Arabica lines. And uh, different lines of this hybrid have been bred in, uh, into other uh, Arabica lines to, to get resistant varieties. Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly here. Timor crosses, they were crossed with Katura. And we uh, and I gave uh, origin to a group of varieties called Catimores. Then it was also crossed with the Asarchi, which is a, a typical variety from Costa Rica, and that gave uh, origin to a line of uh, to a group of varieties called Sarchimores. And then in Colombia, they cross it with Yellowcatura, and that gave line to a group of varieties under the Colombia line. So all of these groups here, as I listed before. Catimores, Sarchimores, Colombiano. These pretty much include all the varieties of coffee that are grown today in Latin America. These are some of the most, the, the most widely grown varieties. Again, depending on how good a job they did into back crossing the Arabica genes into the, into the hybrids, the, the varieties tend to have uh, 
significantly different flavor profiles. Some are definitely better tasting than others. But again, with uh, processing methods and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, even fermentation techniques that are being used now in coffee processing, the flavor profiles uh, can be improved tremendously. I'll ignore this. So when we talk about coffee, the, the one on the left is what we call a tall plant in the Arabicas, and this can be three meters or higher. The uh, semi-dwarf is the middle, which is a 225. And, uh, and the dwarf varieties are in the 180, up to 180 meters. And these are where the Katura and some of the other uh, Paches and, and, and other varieties tend to be grouped. They're dwarf. Highly uh, productive, very precocious, and uh, and really the inner nodes are really closed, which is what you can see on the right picture. The the um, characteristic of the uh, typical varieties is that they tend to look lanky because the uh, the, the 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 inner nodes are separated are longer than what you see in the uh, dwarf varieties that tend to have the uh, the inner nodes very closely to each other. Leaves the pairs of leaves are pretty close, and the plants look more full, as opposed to the typical lines or or the um, taller varieties that that tend to look uh, very lanky. We take a look at the chat here. Robust dominant country. Okay, take a look at the chat, Frank, and if there's any question that pops up, let me know. Okay. So what, what I have here is a listing of varieties. If you want to read about coffee varieties, I recommend that you go to the all this information on the right, uh, this chart here came from uh, Google World Coffee Research. And they have a catalog of varieties that uh, available for download. You can download or you can read online and uh, it tells you all about the different varieties of coffee there are. No, not all of them, but most of them that are grown in Latin America or worldwide. And, um, and they, have, they do a lot of uh, research into coffee variety. They're doing a lot of tissue culturing, trying to... Uh, to, to help uh, you know propagate some of these varieties uh, or F1 hybrids are look they are looking at where they do crosses and then they propagate the uh, the first uh, progeny and trying to uh, to improve uh, either yield or copying quality or tolerance to diseases and um, but because of uh, they are F1 they tend to be very unstable over time. So the only way to, to, to address that is by tissue culturing, by propag you know, by vegetative, vegetative propagation. And so they are doing a lot of research into uh, tissue culture in some of the, uh, these F1 hybrids, and they have trials going with collaborating countries pretty much all over the world. One of the challenges though, is that um, they struggle with, uh, there's been a struggle with tissue culture is that the uh, depending on where the uh, the uh, the shoot is uh, is taken, uh, the plants sometimes don't show this uh, apical growth, and, and they tend to be like spreading low, and uh, and the root system is sometimes weaker as well than uh, than a seedling, because they don't have a tap root. So you have a very fibrous, shallow root systems, and the plants that don't grow vertical, they tend to grow sideways. So they uh, they realize that they gotta have uh, propagate the apical merge stem so that they have that orthotropic growth. So I'll go quickly through this variety, typical Arabico from Ethiopia, Bourbon. I mean, there is red Bourbon, there is yellow Bourbon, there is pink Bourbon, and there is a number of other lines. Robusta, which is the one from Ethiopia. Oh, that there here is a better picture of the leaves. Perhaps this will help uh, the person with the question about being able to distinguish them. And like I mentioned, the the, the clusters of, of beans are pretty close and well defined. I mean, it's really tight. Catuai is a variety from Brazil, very uh, 
productive and uh, good quality Pacamara from El Salvador. Catura from Brazil as well. Excuse me just a sec here. E Cafe 90 or 90, it has a, a Catimor selection uh, developed uh, in Honduras or established in Honduras. This is another variety from Honduras. Parinema is another variety from Honduras. This variety is in the Sarchimor group and uh, the characteristic is that it has a higher tolerance to nematodes and much better coping quality than some of the other Catimors. Uh, that I mentioned. Ica 2 is an Arabusta, the cross of Canephora with red bourbon. Very a good variety as well. So, climatic requirements. Two pictures on the right here. One is uh, Honduras, the other is Colombia. Uh, Colombia, I would say it's uh, most of the coffee growing in the, uh, it is what you see on that picture, full sun, hardly any trees, which uh, I don't know if, uh, if environmentally that is a good thing, but that's how they grow in Colombia. And it had a lot to do, I guess, with the higher elevation. They need full exposure to the sun to maximize the energy intake for the coffee plants. In Honduras, we are more uh, lower, <clears throat> kind of lower elevations. So um, you get, uh, good light filter in uh, through the uh, uh, shade trees. One thing about shade coffee is that the canopy of your shade trees has to be anywhere from six to 10 feet above the canopy of the coffee. That allows airflow and ventilation. And so when people here in California are trying to grow coffee as a companion crop to avocados, avocados, and I'll show you some photos, not on avocados, but with chirimoya, and some with avocados as well later on, uh, don't provide the right shade for coffee because uh, if you put them under the avocado trees, they will not grow. I mean, it's too much shade. So what people try to do here is to put them uh, on the side <clears throat> or between the rows. And at that, in that case, what they do is kind of they intercept light at an angle. So depending on, on, on the orientation of your field, you'll be able to either block the sun some, uh, provide some shade, or you will uh, deprive your plants completely of shade. So I question that principle of, of growing coffee as a companion crop to avocado. I don't think, uh, I think it's very case specific where you could make it work. Again, you know, depending on the orientation of your, uh, of your rows, and that is very highly dependent on the topography, right? Because uh, depending on what slope or how your slope is oriented, you may not have any, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, any uh, control over that. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what, what uh, you know, some sort of a growing system that I think may work in, uh, in California, as opposed to, to what is being uh, commonly proposed as a companion crop to avocado. The other aspect of it is the management of the crop. I mean, you have a, a, a coffee crop and an avocado crop that you're managing simultaneously. I would say uh, that is not the most efficient setup that, uh, that you can think of in a, in a really normally spaced avocado grove. I've seen intercropping avocados and, and coffee in Costa Rica, but the coffee trees, I mean, the avocado trees are spaced out really in a much wider, like uh, a third of the density that you find here in California. And then the coffee is planted at normal density. And here is the opposite. You know, you space your coffee really wide and then your avocados normal spacing. But uh, again, tropical coffee is usually grown under partial shade as an understory crop, but it also adapts very well to full sun. And if uh, Costa Rica does a lot of full, full sun grown coffee, Optimum temperature range between 59 and 75. And uh, that is something that we have here in, uh, in coastal California. So that's one of the reasons coffee plants grow very well here. They like high humidity with well-defined rainy and dry season. That is key. And, and it kind of has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, how plants get confused here in the US. 
because in the tropics, like uh, Central America, for example, coffee undergoes a dry spell from, say, December to March, sometimes April, with very scattered rains. The plants look dusty and wilted, and they seem like they've been abandoned. So really, they look terrible. With the first rain, those plants come back to life. All the buds that were kind of a hiding on those branches, you know, wake up. And then in a week or so, they just explode with blooms. So in El Salvador, they were telling me that coffee needs, coffee plants need about 35 millimeters of water to trigger bloom. And that is something that then that is overhead watering. I mean, rainwater. And we usually apply water to the root system. So that's one of the areas that we've been discussing with some local growers here. Can we play with uh, hydraulic stress, kind of a, you know, starving the plants for water a little bit, and then maybe use overhead irrigation to try to, to wake up those buds. Uh, and that is also, that was also mentioned in Hawaii where they drip irrigate their, uh, the Kauai Coffee Company, they drip irrigate their plants, but, during the onset of bloom, they they go over, I think, and they give them a, an overhead irrigation if they don't get any rain during that time of year, just to, to wake up the buds into flowers. Um, they some varieties, depending on on the variety and how easily the uh, the, the cherries come off the tree, are very susceptible to wind damage. Um, they are susceptible to freezing temperatures. And we've experienced that here in a field trial that we did at Cal Poly Pomona. Arabica coffee, it's considered a high elevation coffee and it grows well uh, higher than 1800 feet to 3600 feet. Uh, whereas Robusta grows from sea level to about 3000 feet. Um, yeah, they must be planted in shady areas. But uh, but they adapt well to uh, to this uh, you know to full sun. Soil they prefer well drained soil, uh, a slightly acidic, and high organic matter, and that is typical of our tropical rainforest in Central America. If uh, pH is a problem, uh, usually in the tropics the pH is too low, so they have people have to to add uh, gypsum to bring the pH up a little bit. Um, but here in the states, I would say our pH is too uh, too too salt. I mean, too alkaline. So it would probably benefit from organic matter and maybe uh, try to bring it down a little bit, so that they are in you know around six, uh, which will be ideal. I think uh, five and a half six uh, for for growing coffee. If um, if you're growing your plants in containers, you got to repot them every so often to accommodate the root system and to promote growth. Otherwise, your, your root system, if you leave them in a small pot, the top root will just kind of make a U-turn and, uh, and bend upwards and your plant will collapse. You know, in a, in a, it's a matter of time, you know, one, two, three years, but as, as the plant grows and start blooming and fruiting, they will just die. Uh, an azalea mix or acid-loving plant mix could be used. But again, you know, we got to amend it uh, with organic matter or perlite to improve drainage and porosity and keep an eye on the pH, uh, kind of keep it around six, six and a half, uh, slightly uh, on the acidic side. Watering, we play with coffee, but we don't really know, as I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we don't really know how much water they, uh, they need. We tend to, I would say, if you ask me, we tend to overwater them um and that uh, we could reduce the amount of water or at least alter the timing of the irrigation pattern you know try to reduce water to mimic what happens in the native in their native habitat in the tropics and then try to play with uh with the water uh combination of drip versus overhead and try to to get them to bloom and get a, a kind of a, a compact bloom season or blooming cycle that will reduce the, uh, that will concentrate production and will have a really beneficial impact on labor costs because you, otherwise you have like green coffee, flowers and ripe coffee on the plants at all times. Roots are fibrous and, uh, and somewhat shallow, although they do have a taproot that goes, uh, you know, deep into the ground. 
but uh, they, I would say, go with higher frequency, higher frequency as opposed to uh, the longer irrigation intervals. You know, short intervals, higher frequency irrigation. I have my plants, which I'll show you in a few minutes, in 15 gallon pots. And I water them for 10 minutes, three times a day, you know, sure, for two reasons. One is that the uh, water doesn't, uh, that eliminates runoff, just kind of uh, get enough to wet the pots. And two, it keeps that soil uh, moist <clears throat> without being uh, saturated. Watering should be reduced to a minimum in the winter. And, and again, this is something that more research is needed and hopefully we'll fine tune that to, so that we uh, were able to, to, to generate a good bloom, a, a compact bloom, and uh, <clears throat> which will give the, because uh, the other problem we're seeing here in, in Southern California is that typically the, ra uh, the, the, the ratio of cherries to green coffee to finish roasting ready green coffee is five pounds of cherries to one pound of green coffee. That is very average in, in Central America. Here in California, we're seeing about 10 pounds of cherries to one pound of coffee, meaning that we have a lot of cherries that don't have any beans in them or have a, 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 a beans that are not full. So the density of the bean is really low and uh, therefore, they get eliminated when you float the cherries. You know, floating meaning you dump, you sink your coffee chair, your cherries in a, in water, and then everything that floats means that is an empty shell, empty cherry. So you don't you you kind of discard those, and that's why the ratio of of uh, cherries to green beans is pretty high. And we need to really bring that number down because it is very inefficient uh, the, at that rate, at that rate. The other thing is like tomatoes, coffee plants will tell you when they need water. Uh, although they don't, you know, they will not necessarily drop the leaves unless it is severe, you know, exposure to drought. But for the most part, they just, they'll just look wilted, you know, and they will look wilted, sad, and, uh, and they will come back to, to life. Uh, you know, after uh, you water them again, we had a <clears throat> when this happened. So there is they're they're really drought tolerant or somewhat drought tolerant. We had a at this time I think Tony Tony Pacheco was uh, got sick and I travel out of country and then people at South Coast Field Station they didn't uh, notice that our plants needed water or and I didn't tell them. Either so, uh, when I got back, this is how some of the plants looked terrible. You know, they had dried up, but I decided I wasn't going to throw them away. So I just uh, stumped them, cut the uh, the dead tissue. You know, cut the stems up, and you can see on the right here how they uh, they they came back. A lot of them came back and are full plants again. You know, they uh, almost caught up with the. Uh, with their, their companions, which su surprised me a great deal because of uh, they, they, you know, you would have thought they were totally gone. Propagation, it's uh, most commonly done by seed, but uh, again, tissue culture is gaining popularity. Uh, grafting is, uh, tissue culture is here in the yard. This is some experiment that was going on in Honduras. As I was telling you, they were trying to, to grow some of these F1 hybrids. Uh, seeds, uh, seed selection is critical. So you select plants from uh, seeds from uh, plants that are not the youngest, not the oldest. And you tend to get your seeds from the middle section of your plant and, uh, and select the best looking fruit, the best looking seeds. Um, germinate them in beds. I usually use like a... Uh, a sunshine mix number two or four works really well. Uh, you, your, your seating bed has to be about at least six inches deep. If uh, eight, pro, 10 would probably be better because the roots go really deep. And it uh, takes about 40 days, you know, from, uh, from seating to, uh, 
to germination. And you can speed up, uh, speed up the germination part of it. You know, you can soak your seeds in water. Uh, you put them in, uh, in some sort of a, of a bag or a, or a sock and, uh, and then they, you know, dump it in a, in a bucket of water until they swell up and rehydrate. And then you put them out in a seeding tray and they work really well. You can germinate them in seed, seeding trays as well. Uh, individually, but I usually do it in uh, what the picture there is, is a concrete tub, the larger concrete tub, and I can put about a pound of seed per tub, or or you can use one single seed per, per, per plug per cell, but the cell, again, has to be at least six inches, if not more, deep. So tubes work, uh, some of the, uh, of the three propagation uh, trays or tubes work really well with coffee you're planting individual seeds. Uh, they, they, the recommendation is to place them face down. Uh, that way the, uh, the embryo goes straight into the ground as opposed to going up and, uh, and then finding, making a U-turn and going back down. So you get stronger plants that way, but they germinate either way and they grow fairly well either way. And, uh, and again, quality control, you select your seeds well once you're, you're pulling out your seedlings. Um, pit moss, what I've used, I usually is a, <clears throat> a mix of uh, sunshine number two. I, I add a little bit more uh, perlite just to make it more, uh, to, to improve the drainage. But uh, you can use it straight out of the bag and uh, just make sure you break up uh, any, uh, any, clots or whatever, and uh, and make sure that it is really loose because if the roots hit anything like a, like a grain of a, a perlite or a, or a cluster of dirt that is compacted, it will uh, bifurcate and uh, and that will be a plant that we will discard when we select seedlings. And I'll show you a picture of that. So seed beds uh, or trays must be kept moist, preferably covered. You know, I use burlap to cover them up. Uh, or any other uh, <clears throat> type of uh, meshy material that allows ventilation will work as a cover. 40 days to germinate and start emerging. And, uh, and they should be ready for transplant uh, after 90 days. What you see here in the left and, and middle picture is what we call the, uh, they call this the soldier state, where the... Uh, you can transplant your seedlings at this stage. It is safe to do this even before they open up their cotyledons. So the, the root system on the seedlings uh, on the left picture are twice as large as the uh, part that is outside. So they, they tend to, like I said, they push the, uh, the root, the embryo down and then the, the seed emerges, but, uh, but the root is twice as long as the uh, part that is exposed. So at this point, it is safe to transplant him. Uh, seed selection, this is what you want. The picture on the left, you want seedlings that have a straight root and really a lot of uh, fibers to them. Uh, the plants in the middle, as you can see, this has a bent. The other is, uh, is multiple. It doesn't have a top root. The other, the same. Uh, so these are root defects and you shouldn't plant these or transplant these, unless it's the only seed you got, right? I mean, if you only get like five, six seeds, whatever, 10 seeds, and all of them came out like this, then that's how you have no choice but try to grow them. Um, they are usually transplanted into liners. These are uh, two liter plastic liners, four to uh, five inches in the, anywhere from three to five inches in diameter. The critical part here is more the uh, the height of the liner as opposed to the width, because you want a liner that allows that root, uh, the, the top root to grow. And uh, that way it's not constrained by how deep your, uh, your uh, liner uh, is. I think we talked about this, oh, I'm sorry. Talked about these. Oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry. So growing your nursery plants. Uh, this is something that uh, we wanted to fine tune 
And the main reason, it was one of the goals of our project because we wanted to, 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 to be able to produce coffee plants, the good coffee plants, and uh, to, to show growers how to do it because the, the price of coffee plants, if you wanted to get started with coffee as a grower, uh, it's pretty high. You know, you're looking uh, anywhere from, I think the going rate, uh, I, I haven't really, I don't know if, uh, but I think it's about $25 a plant, a plant, any uh, for, a, for a one gallon, I believe, toll, a toll pot. Uh, and that is pretty pricey. I mean, if you're looking at uh, typical coffee planting density, if, if you're doing it commercially, uh, you know, a three by three feet by a three by six, then that's about 2,000 plants per acre times 25. That gets pretty pricey, right? Um, and if you're buying them for your own, uh, for, as, as, for as a house plant, then still, you know, that's pretty pricey for a very small plant. So if you get coffee seeds, uh, and if there's any interest, I got seeds from a few varieties that, you know, if anybody wanted to play with coffee germinating them, I'll be more than happy to accommodate, you know, five, 10 seeds per per person or so. And, uh, and we also have plants that we make available um, in exchange for uh, somewhat of a donation to our coffee research fund, which is largely unfunded. But we demonstrated that we could produce good quality plants and made some of these available to some growers uh, for them to experiment with at a very significantly lower price per plant. As far as fertilizers, as, as you grow your plant, the first year, all you need is uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, which is uh, you want to grow that plant, you want to grow that root system. You don't need any potassium uh, because the plant won't fruit until the second or third year, right? So uh, small amounts, you know, uh, a pinch of fertilizer, your seedlings and your liners or propagation uh, pot, uh, and then increase that as the plant grows bigger. As once they are mature, then you want to have a full formula NPK, but you want to have more um, nitrogen and phosphorus than that and phosphorus than potassium. You want some micronutrients that are critical for bloom, like boron, calcium, magnesium. Uh, they all help with uh, um, zinc, iron. Uh, so you want a complete formula with micronutrients. And I would say uh, like a lawn fertilizer that is a triple 14 plus minor elements is a good, uh, is a good uh, compromise. It's a good, good mix to use. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it is, I think, a jar uh, uh, bag for uh, landscape uh, formulation, triple 14 plus. Uh, I'm not promoting them, but it's just the brand that I've, uh, that, that, that I uh, usually buy for availability at uh, Home Depot or Granjeros or any other garden store or garden center that you can uh, acquire that. They respond well to foliar spray. Anything that has a complete uh, formula with minor nutrients, minor uh, elements in it works really well as well. And uh, if you have a house plant, that is the way to keep it uh, lush and green. You know, give it a spray every now and then on a monthly basis, every two weeks, and your plant will look just beautiful, shiny, lush green. Flowers, uh, they are small <clears throat> and uh, cluster around the, uh, the axis of the leaves. They have five white petals and the flower will, uh, different, they differ depending on the variety. Some of the uh, the dwarf or semi-dwarf varieties will have a shorter petals as opposed to the typica or the tall varieties, geisha, typica, will have a very long uh, petals. And um, according to the literature, uh, about 90% of the flowers are pollinated by the time they open. So they are largely self-fertile, self-pollinating. And, uh, but still there is a 10% variability and that's what's given origin to, uh, to some of the uh, hybrids or selections that have, been, have, that have become varieties over the years. So 
uh, once the uh, the flowers uh, bloom and open, it takes about nine to eleven months from bloom to harvest, typically in Central America. Uh, and that is what represents the challenge for us here, because uh, and probably one of the reasons why the beans don't fill up because the the beans don't have as much time to grow and to fill. So the 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 the, the growth for the cherry for the uh, the the uh, for the seed. The growing period is much shorter, and that's why they probably end up being uh, empty shells. Pests and diseases. I mentioned the leaf rust and the leiabostatrix. Uh, these are other diseases that uh, have a really important and worldwide. The coffee berry disease. Uh, we don't have that in the states. Bacterial blood. Actually, we don't have any of these diseases. We do have nematodes. But we don't have a uh, blight. Uh, we don't have coffee borer either, which is a very specific uh, border to coffee. And uh, it is rampant in Hawaii and it does cause uh, significant economic damage in Latin America in coffee producing areas. Although biological control and some uh, cultural practices can have a tremendous impact in minimizing the effect of the, uh, of the uh, border. Stem borers, leaf miners, mealybugs. Mealybugs, I would say, is probably one of the biggest problems we have in uh, in Southern California. Uh, mites, we haven't seen them. Scales, haven't really seen them. Although minor breakouts of uh, brown scales in, uh, in, in in Irvine or uh, at the field station, but again, these are not necessarily of economic importance. Harvesting. Coffee is harvested typically by hand. I mean, uh, although I would say in Hawaii, if any one of you have been to Kauai, to the island of Kauai, the Kauai Coffee Company, they they use, uh, I believe, uh, blueberry harvesters that have been modified to harvest coffee. That requires a specific varieties, though, because you have to have a variety that is very uniform and um, and one that the uh, let go of the cherry fairly easily. There are some varieties that uh, you have to wrestle the cherries of the plant. I mean, they're really stuck in there, you know, even if they are fully ripe. So you have to have a variety that uh, that is uh, <clears throat> that is not hard to pick. And uh, and that's one of the reasons in Hawaii, in Kauai, they use the uh, yellow katuai, which is a variety that is very... Uh, the uh, the cherry detaches fairly easily from the uh, from the plant. However, that variety is very prone to wind damage. When if you have a wind event and your coffee is ripe, your coffee is going to be on the ground because of how easy it uh, it it comes off the plant. Um, in Brazil, they use the same uh, technology. They use uh, modified blueberry harvesters. Uh, to 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 harvest coffee, and they uh, again, you know, they grow specific varieties that allow them to do that. Um, most everywhere else, uh, Central America, Colombia, the topography does not allow to mechanize the harvest, so everything has got to be done by hand. The same is true of uh, the Hawaii main island, you know, where all the hillsides around Kona, Captain Cook, they tend to be uh, coffee is harvested by hand. And that makes it very labor intensive. The other thing is in Kona, it, and, and it's true here as well, you have coffee that is, uh, you have green coffee and ripe coffee and sometimes even flowers on the plants at the same time. So the seasonality of the coffee is not really well-defined. Your bloom is not well-defined and therefore your, your, your ripening cycle is and harvesting is not well-defined as well either. The pictures on the right, our, uh, is a harvest uh, at, um, at the flower fields in Carlsbad. Grower Mike Milano, he's got a, about an acre plot of coffee there in full production now. And uh, what you see here in the red cherries, that is what they go for. They, they are trying to, to they, uh, emphasize quality. So they are harvesting really the fully ripe coffee, you don't see any coffee that is a partially ripe, well, a few that show shades of yellow. You don't want that if you want to have good quality coffee. So it, it probably it could improve that and have a fully ripe uh, cherries in there. And uh, But they do leave a lot of coffee 
either on the ground or, or discard because of, of their emphasis on quality, which is what the company that, that they process their coffee with, French, emphasizes. They, they are shooting for higher, extremely high quality coffee. But again, they are sacrificing some uh, coffee that, uh, that may still be uh, marketable. Processing the cherries, there are primarily three methods. Once you pick the cherries that are fully ripe, ideally, you can, uh, the, the, the oldest method, which is how they used to do it in Africa, and, uh, and as a matter of fact, some of the beds that they use for drying coffee are called African beds. It's what we call the uh, a dry or a natural process, where you just pretty much harvest the cherries, as you can see in the, uh, in the trade uh, in the slide before, or you can see the fruit on this plant, and you can rinse them. You can you can wash them to eliminate floats, or rinse them to eliminate uh, dry coffee or any debris that might have gotten into your harvesting um, container. And then you just lay them out to dry in the sun with the skin on. You don't do anything but pick them, rinse them, and then lay them out to dry. That process is called natural. And the flavor profile of those beans is going to be a fruity flavor, high sugar, sweet, and it's going to be a, a kind of a fermented taste like wine, but in a good way. You don't want that uh, fermentation to go rancid or to, or to be a, a, you know, a nuisance or, or, or a, a defect. You want that fermentation to, be a, to add to the profile, to the, to the, to the flavor. Then we have the wet process, which involves uh, you pick the cherries and you you can either remove the, uh, you can again, run them into, rinse them and remove the floats and dry cherries, or you can run it to a pulping machine that will remove the shell. And that shell, uh, the, the coffee, the beans will be covered in mucilage, uh, which is a layer of pectin and, um, and then you let that uh, coffee, that mass of coffee ferment in a fermentation tank or, uh, or container or what have you, but anything that, that the, the coffee is contained and uh, let it ferment for 12 to 20 hours, depending on temperature, elevation and location. And then you rinse all that, that mucilage breaks out and then it's, uh, it, you can remove it by rinsing the coffee with water, you got to stir it up really well, and then uh, that uh, layer, of that that mucilage is uh, is released by the coffee, and you end up with a very crisp, clean chair, uh, bean, which is called parchment coffee, and uh, and that process will give you a um, a very clean cup, really a reflection of what the variety or the genetics is, without any any added sugar through the uh, through the drying process. And then there is the pulp natural or honey. And this is a, uh, an intermediate step where you do rinse your coffee, you pulp it, and then you lay it out to dry with the mucilage on. So it's gonna be a, a sweeter than the washed, but not as sweet or as fermented as the natural processed coffee, right? And uh, so <clears throat> the pictures on the left, it's, uh, this is an African bed on top. And then the other one is kind of an improved uh, version of an African bed, but the principle is the same. You set the cherries out to dry in full sun. And, uh, and you want to start with a very thin layer, almost single layer of cherries, because you don't want any, any bad uh, fermentation to happen. So you want that coffee to lose moisture initially as quickly as you can. So that the, uh, the fermentation then is just kind of enhancing the flavor, but doesn't get moldy or doesn't get any uh, unpleasant flavors. The uh, picture in the center shows you a very typical small coffee grower pulping machine where you run the coffee through the bean, uh, through the, top, the bean on top, pulp comes out in one side, and then the coffee comes out on the other side. Picture on the upper right is what comes out uh, on the uh, into the fermentation tank. As you can see, this is a very bad harvest that this grower did. You don't want to see green coffee 
in your coffee mash because this will impact the flavor of your coffee at the end or dry coffee, as you can see here. Anything black means it's a dry coffee bean or cherry. You don't want that in there. Here on the uh, mass of coffee below, in the photo of the lower right corner, you can see this is a mass of coffee that has been fermented. The uh, coffee on the top the, uh, is very slippery. You, you, you squeeze it and everything comes out of your hand. The coffee at the bottom after 12 to 14 hours of fermentation in that fermentation tank, the, uh, the coffee sounds like, they say it sounds like money. You, you, you squeeze it and, uh, and, and there is a lot of friction because the mucilage breaks down, is broken down. So you rub coffee bean uh, with coffee bean and it makes a distinctive sound. Or as one of the methods to check that the fermentation is, is right and the coffee is ready to be washed, you get a, a stick and you stick it in the coffee, in the mass of coffee, and the, uh, and the hole doesn't collapse. You pull the stick and the hole stays intact, which doesn't happen with the mass of coffee on top. And then there are other tools that you can use. There is in Colombia, they use a, a, a conical tool that they call the uh, Fermaestro, where uh, coffee, uh, they, you fill it out, it's, a cone, it's like a cone, really. And um, you fill it up with coffee soon after you pulp it, and stick it in the coffee mass. And then because of the mucilage breaking down, that mass of coffee inside the, uh, this tool breaks down. And that is, an, uh, and then there is, a, some, uh, there is a scale that shows you when it collapses to a certain level, then it's ready to be washed and remove the mucilage. So coffee processing at home. These are some cherries that I got from my plants here in Irvine. This is the ripening, the ripeness you want to see in your coffee. No hints of uh, green or yellow. This is the uh, mass of coffee in the center. And, uh, and I removed the pulp using this corn grinder that you see here. Then I fermented it, washed it. And once I dried it, I removed the, uh, the parchment using the same corn grinder. So this is my coffee utensil here in Southern California. I use it for pulping and I use it for, uh, for removing the parchment, for, for milling the coffee. And then once I roast my coffee, I don't have a, a, a well, I didn't have at the time a coffee grinder. So I grind the, the roasted coffee with the same tool. So it serves to, to pulp it, to, to mill it, removing the parchment, and then to grind the roasted coffee. Picture on the right just shows you kind of the sequence of uh, the, uh, the the growth cycle for a coffee cherry. What you end up with the chart here, the photos here show you same variety. The the one on the left is a washed coffee, no mucilage, no. It's a very clean, very clean. Uh, parchment coffee. This is parchment coffee. Picture in the center with the brownish color is a honey processed coffee. And the uh, coloration comes from the sugar that was coating the coffee, the coffee beans drying up. And so you end up with that uh, molasses, almost like molasses look to it. And that's what, uh, what gives it that color. So there is a lot of sugar that has kind of a permeated into the uh, coffee bean. And the one on the right, uh, or the third photo from the left, it's a natural processed coffee, meaning that the, it's dry with the rind. All of these, you have to mill and remove the, the outer skin layers to get the green coffee, which is what you end up roasting. And this is uh, the other photos on the right are three other different varieties kind of following the same uh, protocol here. So all that you get to hear, right? Any questions until now? Yeah, I got a question about the leaves. What causes the brown spot on them on the lower leaves? Is it a is it a uh, humidity issue? It's a, it's salt. Gotcha. Yeah, the pH of the water is pretty high. And uh, we see a little bit of a salt burn on the edges of the leaves. Yeah, it's only on the older ones. I'm sorry? 
it always happens on the lower leaves of the plant. Correct. As they get older, they tend to do that. Okay. They, it tends to show more on the older leaves. Right. I have three growing in the window. They get the morning sun, and then I I have a LED lights on them for four hours, and they're doing really good. Um, they're two and a half feet tall, and I spray them with worm tea, and uh, it seems to keep all the bugs off of them. That sounds great. So, yeah, don't uh, don't make sure if you're growing by a window, make sure that they don't get heat directly by by because the the glass windows tend to act right. like a magnifier. Like yeah, uh, it's uh, there. There's a great great big grapefruit tree in front of the window, so they're getting okay. Filtered. So it does uh, filter light. Yeah, because yeah. if you put them in direct sunlight uh, through a window, they they'll get burned. So it's better to put them to one right. side of the window so the sun doesn't hit them straight. Another thing I did was I, I got containers underneath the pots with gravel in them, and I keep them full of water so to help with the humidity. So, you know, and it seems to be working, but I think I'm going to get a humidifier and put in there. Maybe that'll help them better. If they look good, I mean, they, you know, as long as you're, you know, you're watering them well, that they should be fine. I have to water think, every two days or they'll start wilting. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about the humidifier, quite That's honestly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So production in coffee production in the US, uh, other than Hawaii, <coughs> really there is very limited production in the, in California. Um, commercial growers, uh, there is a handful of them from uh, Santa Barbara down to San Diego. And these all started with the work of a former colleague, Mark Gaskell, uh, introduced uh, coffee, J got Jay Roski, a grower in Santa Barbara, to start playing with coffee. And so I think he, they, uh, he, Mark got some seeds from El Salvador or Panama, I don't remember exactly, but uh, or from both places. And uh, they started playing with coffee and uh, they grew well. and. And that is pretty much the uh, beginning of the uh, California coffee industry. Uh, they've uh, identified a few grower collaborators throughout Southern California, and they uh, provided plans and the technical package to for these uh, growers to follow. Uh, unfortunately, we don't necessarily work with uh, with uh, with uh, Jay Ruski's company now called French. Because a lot of the growers that I support are either people that grow fruits in their backyards, like uh, you guys, rare fruit growers, uh, or very small scale farmers that don't have the uh, financial resources to uh, to play with uh, with, uh, with with Jay's uh, program per se, because they tend to be uh, it tends to get uh, it tends to get pricey. The other thing. I'll tell you, initially, I uh, I dismissed coffee as a potential crop. Uh, I uh, just said, it's not going to work. You know, having grown in a, my family has a coffee farm in Honduras and uh, listening to, to stories of how they migrated and spread and spent Christmas in a shack up in the mountains when it was harvest time. You know, it is not something that that I found, uh, you know, really enticing to tell you the truth. So I dismiss it because of the labor costs, the water requirements, and a number of issues, and knowing how coffee prices worldwide we're looking at, because they've been depressed. I mean, the coffee prices have been really terrible for the, uh, it's kind of almost like uh, cattle, you know, it's a 10 year cycle. Uh, and and uh, well, I'm saying 10 year cycle doesn't cattle, but not necessarily in coffee, but it's kind of an up and down thing. Um, it's just these past two years uh, that coffee prices have improved, but they were in the 90 New York stock prices, the exchange prices for commodity coffee were in the uh, 90 cents to a pound, which don't even cover cost of production. So a lot of coffee farms were abandoned in Central America because of that. Um, and uh, now it is, uh, it's been hovering around $2. It goes up to, to 10, 180. So that, you know, in that price range, it pays for the expenses. And, uh, and so things are looking better for coffee growers. 
that said, uh, a lot of uh, coffee grows really well uh, in, in Southern California. I mean, and these are photos from uh, people in backyard. Uh, Martha is not in the audience, is she? She's a grower in, uh, in Southern, in, in, in uh, uh, Long Beach. I'm sorry? Long Beach? Yes. That's what I was looking for. And uh, she sent me this photo when she found out that we were uh, playing with coffee and she harvests, she said she harvests a few pounds, a couple of pounds uh, yearly from her plant, which I'd probably say is uh, more than likely a Katura or a Katuai. But plants, again, they, they grow really well. They bloom really well. They load up with cherries, except for the fact that the uh, conversion factors are not necessarily efficient in terms of pounds of cherries to green coffee. But if you're doing it for fun, you know, that's, that shouldn't be a concern. Plants still look beautiful and, uh, and fun to grow. So... California grown coffee. The, the these photos are from uh, from the web French uh, company's website, and the photo on the upper left uh, it's a Jay Roski, the grower, and his grove up in, uh, in 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 Goleta, I believe it is, Santa Barbara County. And this is how uh, to get his coffee established early on. They build this. Uh, um, agrivon type uh, mini greenhouses or in enclosures with uh, chicken wire underneath to support them because uh, of the susceptibility of coffee to uh, to frost damage. Once it gets going, I mean, this is a uh, Scott Murray shared this photo with me on the lower left. This is a couple of rows in between avocados and plants are looking uh, looking good. And I believe that is a geisha variety. And uh, this is, again, another hillside from uh, Jay's uh, farm in, uh, in Goleta, where he grows coffee. Um, the photos here, most of them are, uh, except for the one on the upper left, from uh, the flower fields in Carlsbad, where uh, Mike Milano has this patch of coffee. And uh, again, well, no, actually, this is a, a variety trial. The photo on the, on the, on the center, top center, it's a variety trial that we have going on at uh, the flower fields where we're, we're, uh, we planted 15 different varieties trying to see how they adapt to that environment. And this is a replica trial of, uh, of another one that is at Cal Poly Pomona. And uh, is that if at some point there is any interest in going and take a look, uh, we can certainly accommodate uh, you know, a field visit to that site if, uh, if you guys were to be interested or in collaboration with other CRFG groups here in, uh, in either Northern San Diego or, or in San Diego County. And this is again, what they do in uh, at the flower fields. I show you the photo here on the left because it is uh, one of the problems that we deal with. Typical coffee plant structure is a single axis going vertical. As you can see here, this plant has one, two, three, four, five, I believe six different axes. And that creates to a plant that is overcrowded. This is in full sun. And, uh, and again, it just way too many leaves, way too crowded. All the photos on the, uh, the rest of the photos on the slide is uh, what I call my coffee forest at South Coast Field Station. And these are in containers in a shade house that is 50% shade. And one of the interesting things that I've noticed here in this, in this little uh, experiment here is that the plants, they do grow in a structure that is typical of their native environment. So that leads me to believe that if you want to grow coffee, you probably better off growing it with shade and then uh, plant it as compact. You can tell this, these 15 gallon pots are right next to each other. So they, they should, they could use more space in between the rows, but they are doing well uh, between the, uh, in between plants. They could, they could benefit from spacing a little bit more, but I'm, I'm constrained by, by how much space I have available. But they do show this single axis and then the lateral branches, which is what you want to see in a coffee plant, you know, single axis, lateral branches as the plants uh, get older. 
then they start sending sublaterals and that's what gives you production. Coffee produces only on, on one year old wood. So the, the, the coffee production keeps going up with the plant. You know, you get your, your middle portion, middle, I mean, lower portion, middle, and then up. And, uh, and, and, and again, your coffee keeps going up. Once you reach a height, as you can see from the photos here that are in the, in the third uh, set of photos, this is a typical plant that I topped at about two meters. And you can see where I topped it. And, uh, and you can see that uh, it's starting to sprout and, uh, and the plants are growing beautifully. And it's got a, a lot of, uh, you can see the cherries here, but it's got a lot of green cherries in it. Uh, the other plant is a katwai, a red katwai, and you can see how much coffee it has as well. And uh, so the plants grow really well under shade. They don't look stressed at all, except for the ones on the outer row, which get blasted by the cold wind. But other than that, uh, the plants really like the shade and they grow the way they're supposed to grow in uh, under the 50% shade. The other thing is that they don't produce a lot of shoots that you see with coffee in, uh, in full sun. You know, you get an enormous amount of green uh, of biomass that is uh, conducive to, to, to mealybugs, ants, and a lot of different uh, spiders that get in there and just mess up your coffee plant. So a research project that we looked at uh, at evaluating uh, variety, uh, Arabica coffee varieties, so I got about 15, yeah, 18 more minutes. We're good, I guess. Um, and then uh, establish a variety garden at South Coast and Hanson Reg just to show people, you know, how um, how plant, how coffee grows and, and also how to produce coffee. Uh, from seed, propagate from seed. Um, as far as education, we wanted to develop a, a, an enterprise budget to help growers decide if it is feasible or not. Although we, ha we, we haven't really uh, the, gotten good enough data from the yield side to be able to, to, to make a good budget. Um, and again, this is all targeted to limited resource, small scale growers and uh, trying to, to, to get them, help them get the bug out if they have a curiosity about growing coffee. And uh, we were supposed to organize an annual workshop or field day to disseminate results. And we did that two years, but then COVID came up, I mean, hit, and we haven't been able to do that. And the other aspect of this is what we call a citizen science uh, component to it, where I made plants available to, to master gardeners that are affiliated, affiliated with our office here in San Diego. I also donated, uh, made a lot of uh, seedlings available to, to California Rare Fruit Gore chapters uh, here in San Diego County, and uh, even uh, took some to, uh, to the uh, CRFG in, uh, in Stockton, I believe it was, you know, the Central Valley CRFG, to try to see you know, to, for, for their members to grow coffee and see how the different varieties or coffee plants behave in their specific microclimate. So we started with a trial <clears throat> in 2017 at Cal Poly Pomona. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, I think they gave us the coldest place on the campus. Which uh, and I said that because it was uh, they they took out uh, a few dying uh, citrus trees that you can tell here in the photo uh, with the with the green flags and uh, that was a very cold spot uh, <clears throat> a lot of golfers too so plants uh, struggled but got established we established that in March of 2017. Uh, plant spacing three feet between plants and seven feet between rows three plants per variety. And uh, we were monitoring weather and, uh, data from a semi station that is on campus. So the photo that I showed you before, it's uh, March, 2017. The second set of photos, this is uh, August. And uh, the first one on the left is August. You can see the plants are growing and uh, pretty much taking off. A lot of new growth on the right photo in the October 2017. 
monitor uh, the, 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 the width of the stems, the canopy and uh, the girth of the plants, the average uh, thickness of the trunk. Uh, this was a project that uh, a grad student was collecting some of this data and average canopy size. We measure with uh, kind of a perpendicular measurements of the uh, of the canopy to arrive at an area. So again, uh, 2017, and this is uh, after the winter. You can see how many plants survive. So we uh, we lost them, um, the ones that are not dead here and that are dying, you know, weeks after. So we uh, we pretty much scratched that trial. Um, Simultaneously, I had an observation trial at South Coast adjacent, adjacent to my blueberry patch. And I guess only in California, you can see coffee and blueberries, you know, growing side by side, right? Plants adapted really well and they grew very nicely. But again, you can tell on the photo on the lower right corner after winter how they, uh, <clears throat> how they ended up. They uh, ended up, most of them ended up dying also. So this was an observation trial, five plants per variety, three feet apart. And uh, following the layout of the blueberry patch, they were uh, spaced uh, 10 feet between rows. I also try to see whether uh, coffee would work as an understory crop to Chirimoya. There is a, a germplasm collection of Chirimoyas at the station. And I convinced Derek, uh, I mean, uh, Darren, Haver, the director, to let me put a trial under the Chirimoyas. And we put, again, the same layout as called Poly, same number of varieties, 13 varieties, three plants per treatment. Um, they were not getting <clears throat> additional water. So any water they got was from the, uh, from the Chirimoyas. And uh, after a year or two, the plants were still alive, but, uh, but too shaded. They never did anything, never grew. Uh, a lot of factors into place. One is uh, water was somewhat limited. And the reason was they didn't want an additional set of irrigation lines in there or sprinklers because of the uh, traffic of people. You know, there is a lot of volunteers that do work at the, uh, the grove there. So they didn't want anybody trampling or, or, or falling over because of liability. And, uh, and then the other was the cost of water. I didn't have any funds to, to, to finance this research. So we were subject to use uh, whatever the Chirimoyas didn't want per se. The soil though is very compacted because of the Chirimoya root system. And, uh, and that had a lot to do. I mean, even digging the holes to put the plants in was a, was a major undertaking because you had to cut through roots and and it wasn't easy. So, I mean, the, 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 again, there were not favorable conditions for coffee plants. Eventually, the plants, uh, like I said, uh, never developed into anything uh, pleasant. So we pulled them out and, uh, and uh, what you see, and, and the plants that are now in the lath house in my coffee forest are the ones we rescued from that trial. These are Scott Murray's photos and, uh, and shows you some of the challenges. Well, the photos that I've showed you too, it gets extremely expensive to establish coffee plants if you're taking them out to, to outside in the elements, you know, when they are young plants. It just takes a major uh, effort to, to build up the way they do it, building individual quote unquote greenhouse for every plant. Uh, the erratic uh, <clears throat> growth behavior is also another issue that we got to address. And that's how the plants respond when growing in full sun. These are my plants in the observation trial at Irvine. They just get crowded and a lot of new shoots where they should be setting flowers. The other one is the mealybugs. They, they are a problem with, uh, especially in the greenhouse where I have my plants. They are not as much a problem when you go in the field but still is something to keep an eye out for. So one of the things that we ask people is how to get involved with our research. And uh, there is potential for CRFG and Master Gardener collaboration, as I mentioned, to, to, to a citizen science where we make coffee plants available. Uh, if it is seedlings, you know, we make them available for free. Uh, if it is plants of different sizes or various sizes, 
would like, if nothing else, to recoup the cost that, uh, of the uh, supplies that have been put into it. But, uh, but again, I th we think it is a good way to, to, to engage uh, you guys, uh, CRFG members, master gardeners with our research. And that way we, you get to experience, you know, trying to grow the plants and we get to, to, to get information if I create some sort of an information loop, a feedback loop where you guys tell us how the plants are doing in your location, when do they bloom, how long the bloom cycle is, how many blooms per season. And that kind of information that is only uh, going to help us all learn more about coffee and how they behave in, in our Southern California environs. Uh, these are some of the plants that I have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, available. I have plants that uh, definitely in, in need of a home. These are two liter liners, plastic liners here on the uh, upper left. I have them in, in this uh, 10 inch tube which is the same age as well, or one gallon pots, single plant or single plant or double plant per pot. I have a collection of a set of catuais that are uh, that has a, a, a yellow and a red plant or, and a red cherry variety in it. So we would like to call that, uh, if, if, they, if we got into fruit or ripen during Christmas, we call that the Christmas collection. Um, just for, you know, Tony and I having fun of uh, what we do with these plants. And uh, we have a tall one gallon pot as well in the lower left uh, photo. Uh, and then we have some in, uh, in the seven gallon pots as well. And these are pretty tall. I mean, 24, 30 inches tall. So that's all I have. Uh, it was, if, there were, if there is any questions that I didn't answer during my uh, conversation, please let me know and we'll uh, address it now. And also, if there are any additional questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, somebody was asking how old are the plants? Which ones? The ones, that oh, you the ones I have? This? Yes. These are, some of them are various ages. These, uh, these I believe are uh, 20, the, the seeds were from 2021. So they were seeded in 22 and uh, they are now what? A year and change old. The one in the seven gallon pot here is, uh, is a 2020 seedling, no, 2019 seedling. But one of the beauties with coffee, and I'll tell you this from practical experience, is you can have coffee plants, uh, if you don't fertilize them, they will stay put and don't push growth. And, uh, but the minute you either repot them or, fer or feed them, they will explode and grow. And if you don't fertilize them, but you get a lot of water, could that leach out stuff out of the soil? Uh, potentially, yeah. And then um, any issues with um, municip municipality water? Should it be filtered at all? Well, I, I, again, you know, it's, uh, you see it like you see in some of these photos here, there is some uh, tea burn and that's because of the salts. Uh, and it has to do with the water. We don't filter the water. And even in uh, Irvine, we use reclaimed water, which is even saltier, you know, more alkaline than typical tap water. And somebody asked, would you recommend a nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer for non-blooming coffee plants? Definitely. That is all you want. A DAP 1846O is what we normally use. Uh, but anything with, uh, without potassium will work to grow your plant. But you want to grow the root system and the, uh, and the foliage and then kind of green up the foliage. So. And then somebody asked, um, how tall should the plants be pruned to? How what? How tall should the plants be pruned to? I would say it depends on typically uh, height of the operator is the um, height of the picker, but uh, we normally uh, tip them uh, or top them at uh, seven feet, six, seven feet. Okay. Yeah, and one of our members has a, um, a coffee plant that's growing underneath one of their eaves near their front door. And apparently that does pretty good on the coffee. And he lives in Huntington Beach. That is that is or isn't good. 
Well, it seems to be good for him. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, partial partial shade uh, works really well. And then um, somebody put, what is your secret for a medium roast? Or do you like, do you use light and dark roast? I would say the... Uh... The, the 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 happy medium for coffee to express the uh, to really for 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 to enjoy the genetics and the process, it's a medium rust. Because uh, the light uh, light rust, it it uh, you still get some kind of earthiness to it. I mean, it's not fully cooked per se, but the uh, medium rust uh, will allow you to enjoy the the full flavor of the coffee and you will not burn the sugar. So if you're using like a process, a honey process or a natural, and that's even more critical for, for honeys or, pro, or or natural processed coffees, because you don't want to burn the sugars. And there is a lot of sugars in those beans because of the way they were processed. Okay, and then what is the blooming season for coffee? All over the place. I mean, uh, like I was telling you, what I'm seeing in the uh, in the greenhouse, the plant here that is on the on the right photo, that is uh, full of buds, and it, and that is encouraging because it is now bloom time in Central America for coffee. So if I could get that plant to mimic that, then probably those cherries will be growing into December, January when I'm when I'm harvesting them. And there is a, a good nine to 10 months uh, growth cycle for them. So they, they start blooming depending on the microclimate here in the Southern California uh, from uh, now until June, July. Okay. And then I um... have, uh, well, the coffee that, that I showed you on my plants a few uh, slides uh, back. These pictures, uh, this was taken today. So that's uh, probably uh, August, July, August bloom probably, or later. Okay. And, and, and again, it... they grow well in pots. Uh, the larger the pot, obviously the better. Uh, don't grow them in, uh, if you grow them indoors, don't put them right in front of a window, especially if, if the sun comes through and, and it's full expression. If, uh, if, uh, if you have a sunny, if you're, you know, window, put them to offset them to one side or the other. You don't want that light to hit them directly. Uh, if you can, uh, if you grow them under shade, make sure that the shade, uh, the tree or, or shade, the structure you're using is a good five feet above the canopy of the coffee. So you get uh, the light is diffused and, uh, and you get airflow on top of, you know, going through those plants because uh, that is also critical, you know, to, to get some uh, air movement in there. And um, you know what are the common mistakes people make when they're repotting them? Uh, don't pay attention to the roots. Uh, look at the root system. I mean, if if you get a plant that looks, uh, and probably some of these plants that I'm showing you here on the slide that will have to, to be looked at carefully when you take them out of the pot, make sure you straighten out the top root and then uh, kind of break up the root ball a little bit and feel, and you're going to feel a hook in there. And then you straighten it out. And when you report it, make sure that you try your best to, to straighten that. And, uh, and if it breaks, it's better for it to break. Or, and then you prune it and have a, a shorter tap root, but you don't have that uh, root that, that is bent upwards because that is uh, uh, definitely is going to cause that plant to die. And this applies to blueberries as well. That's a common mistake people make with blueberries. You get a blueberry plant from a garden center that has been in a pot for six months to a year. So you get a root ball that is really compact or going in circles. So you got to break that up and make sure you open it up. Otherwise, uh, the plants will collapse uh, three, four years down the road. And somebody put, do some varieties have more of a problem with no beans 
in the cherries or just one bean in the cherries? That is correct. It's, I mean, in genetics. Uh, I wish I could tell you what variety uh, doesn't do that. But, but again, we're trying to learn. Uh, it's kind of a hit and miss here, quite honestly. And from the varieties that I have in Irvine that I've been able to harvest, I haven't had enough quantities of cherries to be able to measure that. We will probably get our first year worth of good data along those lines at the flower fields in Carlsbad this season because our plants will have more coffee that we can uh, pulp and then see uh, or, or use floating before pulping to make sure to, to kind of measure, you know, what has more or less uh, floats or empty shells in them. Okay, and then, oh, and also on our, um, on the plants, I could set up a thing where people just fill out a form and they can submit data to it, then that would go to a spreadsheet automatically for you to see as they do. That'll, the be, that'll be great. I mean, if uh, once, once we get something going, I think uh, we can, uh, and use observations, you know, it doesn't have to be any, I mean, if people were willing to kind of measure growth rate in terms of uh, what I showed you, you know, how thick is this, the, the, the trunk getting, how tall, how wide, uh, the, the, all of that is meaningful information. Um, it's data, right? That can yeah. help us uh, evaluate some of the varieties down the road. So yeah, that'll be kind of, that'll be really cool. And uh, and we've done some of that with the, with the uh, mustard gardeners in our office. We kind of told them, hey, you know, these are things to look at and, uh, and report whenever you feel like doing it. There is no really, uh, I mean, it's a voluntary thing. So and some people are really meticulous about it and some others, you know, are, are not. I got a question about, I, I live here in the Coachella Valley. Is it too hot here to grow them outside? Uh, I would say, yeah. That's why I have mine inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's probably uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, it, it's not necessarily an issue of temperature, but we've tried, we have uh, experiences uh, with dragon fruit out in the valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is the radiation more so than the heat. Right. Because the, the, the like or dragon fruit just melted, you know, and uh, and, uh, and 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 inland valleys here in in southern California in San Diego, it doesn't get as hot, but hot enough to 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 almost right be the same. But the radiation is totally different there. And then we have the humidity, and then it just fries everything. It's like you know steaming everything. Yeah, so. they just cook them. How do we get the seeds from you? I could, I could grow more inside. We um, work with Frank. I can work out a plant with Frank, and I can uh, make up a few seed packets, make them available. Okay. Well, I've, I'm I'm a guest. I belong to the Inland, Inland Empire Rare Fruit Growers, so we got an email saying that this was on, so. Yeah, we'll figure something out. Or, I mean, my contact info is here. If you want to email yeah, me. Yeah, I take a picture of it. I got it. Yeah, that, so that should be fine as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you an email, my address or something. Yeah. Send you some money for postage. <laughs> that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I'm not I'm not shipping plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm a master gardener out here in the Coachella Valley, the in the desert area. So oh, great. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff going on. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Romero, can it, you tell us about the Specialty Coffee Expo and what was the best coffee there? And if you agree that it's one of your favorites? Well, the you mean the one that just happened in Portland? Yes. Well, it wasn't necessarily uh, a competition. Uh, it's just a trade show, pretty much. I mean, it's about people selling all things related to coffee. And then what happened was, uh, say, uh, coffee-producing countries, they all had, like, their own copying sessions where they uh, had coffees from uh, growers or regions of, of the respective countries being copped. And uh, with the idea that 
potential buyers would attend these coping sessions and then that they would buy the coffee from the growers or the, or the cooperatives or the regions or what have you. Um, it wasn't necessarily a, um, an overall comp coffee competition, but the Specialty Coffee Association, which organizes the Coffee Expo, uh, also uh, organizes what's called Cup of Excellence in, 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 in coffee producing countries. In some of them, not all of them. So, um, like uh, they they do handle the Cup of Excellence competition in Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica, uh, El Salvador. I believe Colombia is in, Peru is in, and uh, and they do sanction that. So, in uh, in Central America, the coffee that's been winning consistently is the Geisha variety. And uh, usually processed as a honey. And uh, Panama, which grows, uh, that's where the geishas are starting to become famous. They don't participate in Cup of Excellence. They have their own competition, with it, which is called the Best of Panama. And so uh, they marketed, they, they really done a great job of, of market positioning uh, Panama geisha coffee as the premier coffee in the world and i'll give you an example you know of uh, what's behind a name uh, i think this was 2019 where a uh, cup of excellence in um i believe honduras was first the winner of the cup of excellence at a, an international auction was a honey processed geisha sold for about 85 dollars a pound 83 dollars a pound a couple of weeks later, Guatemala, the winner of Cup of Excellence Guatemala, sold that international auction for about $65 a pound or so. About a month later, Costa Rican Cup of Excellence winner, another geisha honey process, sold for $301 a pound. Wow. And about two months later, Panamanian uh the best of panama winner which was another geisha honey process geisha sold for twelve hundred and ten dollars a pound wow so there you go i mean obviously these are small lots of coffee i think in the case of panama they limit the lot size to a hundred pounds if i'm not mistaken i'm not i'm not, I'm not really don't quote me on that but i think they they only uh, require uh, growers to submit 100, 100 pounds of, of uh, coffee to the competition to standardize it in a way. The other countries, Honduras and uh, El Salvador and uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica, they don't have a restriction. Well, they have a minimum quantity, which is 500 pounds, but not a, not a, a top, nothing on the upper end. So there you go. I think uh, the, the Panamanian lot was bought by, uh, it was a split by between some Korean company and some company out of San Francisco. They had a copying of that coffee in San Francisco and they were selling for $75 a cup. Wow. And they sold out, supposedly. Wow. So, and somebody had a question about, can you roast the naturally dried coffee fruits without removing the skins? Nope. You, uh, you to roast coffee, you gotta remove the uh, the shell and end up with the uh, with the bean. Otherwise, you all, all, otherwise you'll end up with a lot of ashes. But I have read that you can roast the bean with that little thin paper shell on it. Well, but that's but that's the chaff. That's different. Yeah, chaff, that, that's okay? Yeah, well, typically what I do, because I do, like I told you, I remove the parchment in my corn grinder, but, but and that doesn't remove the chaff. So what I do, I put my coffee in a towel, the green coffee, and just really rub it uh, with my hands, and, and that takes care of most of the chaff. Uh, if, and, but still, there is some left, and if you have a roster like... Uh, uh, I have the, uh, uh, what is this roster? An air roster. Now I'm, now I'm doing a blank here. I'm showing my age. 
Uh, but, but usually it has a chamber that captures the chaff because it is a hot air dry, uh, roaster. It pushes the shaft up, and it gets, uh, you know, captured in a in a chamber on the on the lid of the of the roaster. And and if not, if you pan roast your coffee, which I normally do as well, I just uh, kind of blow it, uh, you know, with a fan. You know, I try to uh, cool it and uh, and and blow the shaft. Uh, it burns off, but 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 that's not the same as saying that. You're uh, roasting the um, the skin, the, the 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 pulp. Right, right. We're still removing the fruit, the cherry. Yeah, yeah. from the shaft and the the seed. Yeah, that little film stays there. It's really hard to remove completely. So yeah, that's why most coffee roasters have a have a blower that captures all that. It just blows it off during the roasting process because it it burns and it detaches and. And if it builds up, it can certainly uh, even be a fire hazard. Wow. Any other question or comment, Frank? And let me see here. Oh, somebody said, thanks for the um, your talk on coffee. And I think everybody echoes that. My, my pleasure. And um, one of the things that we did with the CRFG uh, up at Fullerton one time was to have um, uh, the same variety processed differently and then have people taste it just to see if they could pick up the difference in flavor. And that was kind of a cool exercise. So that's something that uh, at some point in time, if there is any other activity or opportunity, it'll be fun to do. But we tried to do it across varieties or across processing methods. But uh, it is easier to pick up the differences in flavor if you do it across processing methods using the same variety than it is across methods with different varieties. Yeah, that's completely understandable. All right, well, I'm going to okay. Let's see. get out of my PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, pleasure talking to you guys. You and I uh, hope the information is useful. And again, you have my, my contact information. If um, any uh, questions come up afterwards, please let me know. More than happy to, to make up an answer for you. <laughs> Thank you. Let me see. All right, guys. Yeah, your screen right. removed weird. I'm sorry? The screen removed weird. It's like you tore the page off and it's floating. Or It looks like a Salvador Dali um, painting. My screen? Yeah, oh, it looks like it melted. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, what we, what, it's one of the backgrounds that some have is a blurred. Oh, OK. Background. I usually have that uh, beach uh, sa uh, zine that uh, that Kathy has on, on, or a coffee farm or nopalitos or something that looks nicer, but I didn't have a chance because Zoom decided to update on me quickly and I was just trying to, to get on. So, yeah, good to see you guys. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Oh, and Romero. Yes, sir. Um, is there any chance there's ever going to be another Dragon Fruit Festival? Not at this station. Uh, I, uh, but we do uh, organize one here in San Diego, which is uh, going to a couple of uh, farms. Um, at the station, we really don't have much to show. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I, I was planning to replan my, uh, replant my trial, but... Uh, but because of the cost of doing business there and the uh, travel time from, I mean, I'm here in San Diego County and traveling to Irvine, uh, it got kind of old and, uh, and, and it won't be like a full trial where I need to have full control of things. So I, I decided I'm not gonna replan it, but I will do have a, 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 some sort of a, a demonstration plot here in San Diego in, in, in Carlsbad which is where I've identified a grower that's willing to, to let me do it. 
Cool. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah, but no, we uh we we do go out to to visit a couple of growers that are gracious enough to to host the uh the group. We did that last year. Went to uh to uh what is the name of the place? Wallace Ranch is one of them in Bonzo. They mm -hmm. grow a, a lot of different varieties. And uh Dragon Delights is the other site in Ramona. Well, on the Highland Valley Road near Ramona that uh, that we went to kind of a really nice uh nicely set up dragon fruit farm under shade and 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 really really well done top notch hmm. cool yeah um but we'll have more people interested in this because we of this meeting on coffee because like i said it's recorded and we're going to put it on a youtube and then we'll actually get more people registering even after the event that sounds good. I mean, uh, any any feedback you can provide, that'll be great. And if uh, any follow up questions, again, be happy to to entertain him. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for speaking, presenting. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. We'll thank see you. you guys. Okay. Bye. Let's Okay, I'm going to close the meeting as soon as I figure out how. Okay, there it is. Good night, everyone. Good night. Oh, let me download the chat.